What's happening, everybody? How are you doing today? You doing good? Very good, very good. Hey, let's welcome all of our live streamers. Washington, Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, Florida, New York, Virginia, West Virginia, Jamaica. Come on, how many of y'all wish you were there right now? Come on. Jamaica, man. South Carolina, Georgia, Rhode Island, and Germany. So uh, there's a couple other places. Very, very, very happy to have you guys. Thanks for tuning in for this service. It's been a great day so far. How many of you know we got, we got a pretty cool church here? We got some really nice things happening, some really exciting things happening. Epic. Uh, we got our back to school drive that we're doing. I want to tell you how important that is for our community. You know, when we started this church, we met in an elementary school. And uh, really, for nine years, we were a mobile church meaning that every weekend we set up and broke down. More than that, we, we strategically decided to meet in a school because we wanted to be a part of the community. And we realized at that moment that there were a lot of students, a lot of kids that didn't have the means for lots of diff- different things, specifically back to school things. They, you know, they would have to use the same backpack for five, six, seven years and um, you know, pass it down from their brothers and sisters and um, barely could afford pencils and pens and paper and all those things. And we realized that it was really important for us as a church to give back to the community. Last night, one of our team mem- members, Nikki Haas, uh, she was standing in line at the Walmart, because that's what you do at the Walmart, and she was having a conversation with somebody there about why she had 200, what would you, would you have, 200 boxes of crowns. She's like, you know, she's like, wow, you, you, you got a lot of kids, and um, she said, well, I'm Catholic. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. Sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, she, she was waiting in line, had, and, and this young man was behind her and was like, hey, what are you doing? Why are you buying all these crowns? Well, you know, she's basically explained the whole, whole program, what we're doing, and how we're blessing the community. Well, that guy decided to buy 200 crowns as well, boxes of crowns. Isn't that fantastic? And really blessed. Doesn't come to the church, not a part of the church, but maybe, he, maybe he's watching right now. Brian, hope you uh, come someday and hang out with us. But uh, it's a real good opportunity for you to give back, and you can do it today. You could leave the church today. You could go down to Walmart, wait in line a little while, come back and bring some stuff. Uh, bring something. I, I forget what today is. I wasn't paying attention during the preview. I've seen it a couple of times. So. But anyway, there, you bring something for kids. Bring a backpack or do something and, and donate. You can also donate financially. You can go online. But that's kind of the easy way out. Honestly, and just give money, but I would encourage you to go and do so. Put your hands around something and do something around that. So it'd be really, really cool. And then um, there's something else I wanted to mention. I don't know what I want to mention. Um, this this room is pretty full. Look around. There's very few chairs available. Um, that happened mainly because our students left. Our our t- kids left. And that's why we're, we're expanding this facility. Uh, we're going to go right out those back doors, and we're going to add another almost 300 seats uh, to this building. Isn't that fantastic? Very exciting about that. But in the meantime... And I'm going to tell you right now, as soon as we build those seats and put those seats in it, they're going to fill up. But here's a great thing that I want to encourage you to do. If you're you're a long-time, long-standing attender here at Freedom House Church, would you consider moving to Saturday night to make some room for someone else, uh, to make the shift, so to speak, over? Somebody needs your chair. The number one times that people come to church are 9 and 11. Uh, For us, it's 10, 30, and 12. Those are the two most attended services. If I could get about maybe 100 of you to make that shift over to Saturday night, um, you you could do all kinds of things. Think of the things you could do on Sunday. You could sleep in. You could serve. You could uh, go to the lake. You could, um, you could, I don't know, you could do all, you could serve. You can serve and uh, come on Saturday night. The messages are way better on Saturday night. Um, my wife preaches. No, I'm just kidding. It's, about, it's, just, it's just a great time. Exact same service. It's, it's a lot of fun. We have nothing at the after the service, so you can go out to eat afterwards. Uh, I usually go over on those nights. That's not a, that's not a bad thing. It's really good. It ends up having, having a lot of fun. Um, that's not the norm, but it happens. So, would you, How many of y'all would consider praying about that? Raise your hand if you consider praying about that. Come on, I need a couple more people. Raise your hand. Force somebody's hand up beside you if they're not raising their hand. All right. Get your Bibles out. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're in the series called Summer Classics, and we're talking about the classic stories that you know and love, the ones that you've uh, been a part of. If you went to vacation Bible school, you saw it on a flannel graph. Uh, you participate. Maybe you even acted one out. We've talked about Joseph. We've talked about Jonah. We talked about, um, today we're going to be talking about David and Goliath. Specifically, how David slayed Goliath and how Goliath represents 
the fears that we face in our everyday life. See, I believe that the enemy's number one agenda is fear. I think fear is the thing that holds us back more than any other uh, thing in our life. Fear grips us, fear holds us, fear paralyzes us. And many of us, even in this room today, deal with fear. I deal with fears. But I want to let you know today, through the life of David and how he defeated this Goliath, this giant. He may seem like a giant, but I can tell you, your faith is big enough to deal with this fear. And I want to promise you, by the end of this service today, you're going to feel like you can just you can take care of any Goliath that you may have in your life. And so we have a giant of fear, fear of rejection, fear of intimacy, fear of commitment. You know, we have our life group launch that this, these next few weeks, and, and many of you are saying, like, no, I don't want to be involved in a life group. That, I'm afraid. There's no way that I would share my stuff in a life group. That's fear. And many times, it's fear that holds us back from the very destiny that God has for us, the purpose that God has for our life. Let me give you a little information about fear, and then we'll talk about this story in 1 Samuel 17, and how this story, I believe, is a great shadow or a great example of how to deal with our fears. If you want to know about anything that we face in life, I believe you have to go back to the garden. The garden is where uh, sin entered the world. Uh, you know, the garden was a perfect environment. God fellowshiped with man, Adam and Eve. They, they, they were in a perfect uh, spiritual environment, a perfect physical environment, until Eve listened to the serpent, Satan, and took of that fruit. Adam followed in suit, and next thing you know, sin entered the world. And so there's an interesting thing that happens in Genesis chapter 3. God uh, realizes this happens, and he comes and he asks Adam, where are you? Now, let me just stop and just say this. God never asks you a question that he doesn't know the answer of. That's right. Never asks you a question. God doesn't say, you know, like, where are you? He's not asking Adam, where are you, because he, you know, lost Adam. You know, it's like, where's Adam? I thought I put him on earth. You know, did he move? Has he got a new job or something? Where did he go? That's not why God asked him the question. God knew that Adam had lost himself. And, and so in order to identify issues in our own life, God will pose questions, listen, that really, ultimately, he wants to be the answer to. And so those questions that he asked us are really pointing to him. And so he asked Adam, where are you? And Adam and Eve, we know, were hiding. And it says in Genesis chapter 3, the first time that we actually hear Adam talk, it says, Adam said, I heard your voice. You know, God's, where are you, Adam? Or somebody told me in the middle, that's a little too high for God. Where are you, Adam? <laughs> Adam, where are you? Where are you? I can't even give that low. So just think Morgan Freeman saying it. So I heard your voice in the garden. This is Adam talking. And what was his response? I heard your voice and I was afraid. Notice that his first response to God's voice was fear. Fear. And the reason that he felt fear is it says, I was afraid because I am naked. Because I am naked. I was naked, Adam said. And as a result of that, the Bible says, so, so we've, got, we've got three things here. His response to the voice of God created fear in him, or fear was there. As a result of that fear, or the fear was caused by Adam realizing that he was naked, and what was his response to being naked and afraid? He hid himself. Now, this is what sin does. Disobedience strips us of our identity in God. Everybody say naked. Now, naked in, in, in this word, naked, means that, that Adam was stripped or uncovered or vulnerable spiritually, emotionally, as well as physically. Now, we immediately go to the physical, but for the most part, he was stripped of his spiritual covering God. He was stripped of his emotional covering God. His soul was covered by the presence of God. And when we sin, God's presence leaves because God can't be in the presence of sin. And as a result, his response was, I want to hide. I want to act in shame. I want to act in guilt. I want to act 
in, in, in this invulnerable place. I'm, I'm afraid of the very thing that can give me life. Now, what is fear? What is this fear? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 gives us a very uh, good understanding of the agenda of fear. It says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Now, you can look at your notes, look on the screen, and we'll get to 1, 7, uh, 1 Samuel 17 in a second. But notice what it says. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of Okay, I want you to underline that in your notes because that's extremely important. Fear is not an emotion. Fear is a spirit. It's a demonic spirit. Now, everybody look at me for a second. If you've been around for any time, you know this, but when, when the devil, when Lucifer uh, basically tried to exalt himself above God, it says that he was cast out of heaven. And the Bible tells us in Revelation that his tail or his influence, his lies, captured a third of the angels. Those angels became demons. One of those demon spirits is the spirit of fear. So the spirit of fear has an agenda. It's not just an emotion. Oh, I'm scared. It's not like Freddy Krueger jumped out. Rah, you know, it's not, that, that's not, that's fright. Fear is a spirit that tries to control and manipulate us because it has an agenda from the enemy. And its number one goal is to keep you from God's best in your life. It's to hold you captive. Now, notice what it goes on to say. It says, God didn't give this to you. He didn't give you a spirit of fear. God gave you a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and of a sound mind, a spirit of discipline. Power, love, and of a sound mind. Now, this is just extra, you know, this is just a sideline note. A spirit can do three things to a person. Number one, a spirit can possess a person. Now, when I say possess, I'm talking about somebody who is a non-believer, somebody that does not have the spirit of God living in them, who has not made a decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ, who has not become born again, who has not made Jesus Lord of their life. I don't believe that someone who has Jesus, I'm talking about really saved. I'm not talking about just you prayed a prayer so you could, could escape hell. I'm talking about you really following God. Like your life is really transforming. Well, I'm not talking about Sunday saved. Come on, I'm talking about Monday through Saturday living for God. Come on, don't shout me down because I'm preaching good already, all right? I'm talking about really saved. Like you wake up tomorrow, you're still loving God. You didn't just check off church on your checkoff list. I'm talking saved. I, I don't believe anybody that's saved, saved. Some of you need to get saved. You just saved, but no, you need to get saved. And so, so I don't believe that person can be possessed. Being possessed by a spirit is being controlled by or under the influence of. Now, the Bible teaches us or tells us a story when Jesus met a man who was possessed of a demon. And that demon, Jesus talked to that demon. I don't recommend you talk to demons. I recommend that you, because they're going to lie to you anyway. And so uh, it, Jesus did it, but that's Jesus, okay? If you face a demon, don't be talking like having a conversation with him and inviting him out for lunch or anything like that. You need to get him out. Okay, if you've ever had that happen, I've cast out some devils in my life, um, and I've, you know, I don't want to have no conversations with them, okay? And so, so you just deal with them in Jesus' name, and they got to go. Jesus cast the devil, the demon, this legion, this group of spirits out of this man and threw him into some pigs. They ran and killed themselves, and uh, that's where bacon became very well known. And so, anyway, <laughs> you, you can also be oppressed by a spirit. Oppression means basically that, that, that this cloud or this, and this is where most believers fall when it comes to fear or any other type of spirit, where a, a, a spirit comes and oppresses them. It presses them. It pushes them in a certain direction. And, and, and tries to sway them in their decision making, sway them in their life. They are oppressed by this devil or, or this spirit. Or they are, uh, there's what's called a familiar spirit. So possessed, oppressed, and a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit is I've gotten free from something, but this familiarity draws me back in to a place where I could become oppressed by it. 
Somebody that's deal, that's like they, they got delivered from alcoholism. They, they, they dealt with alcoholism all their life. And so they think they're all good, and so they go back to the bar to play pool with their friends. Next thing you know, you know, the beer, the wine, the alcohol, you know, is just calling out to them. That's a familiar spirit. That's a familiar spirit. And so fear is a spirit. And recognizing the influence of that spirit is extremely important. Now, let's get to the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I think it's important when you're ever dealing with something in our life, especially from a spirit form, we, a spiritual nature, we need to define it and get some ideas on, on what it is and what's going on around it before we deal with it. We've got to get some vocabulary around it and what the Bible says about it. And so now 1 Samuel 17 is interesting because I think this gives us a great picture on how to deal with with anything that's standing between us and what God has for us. And David gives us a great lesson. Now, let me give you the history. Uh, Israelites are facing one of their arch enemies, the Philistines. The Philistines, whenever you see that in the Bible, is representative of of anything that the enemy is trying to hold you back or the Israelites back from attaining. They're, they're, they're best in God. And so the Philistines always showed up. They were a seafaring nation. They came from the sea, and they just would always just show up. They just all the time showing up against the, uh, against the Israelites. And so David, is an, he had been anointed as king in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Saul was the positioned king. The Israelites, prior to this, had cried out to God, give us a king, God. Everybody else has a king. Will you give us a king? And if you bug God enough, he will give you something that you don't need. And so he gave the Israelites, he wanted to be their king. He wanted to be their leader. And so he picked, you know, Saul was picked and, and, and he looked like a good king. He smelled like a good king. He was taller than everybody. But even on his inauguration, he was an insecure man. Very insecure, so much so that he was hiding when he was called out to be the king. And so God says, oh, uh, you know, we got to get rid of him. We got to put a a, a real guy in. So he picks David, the 17-year-old kid. Just because someone is positioned somewhere doesn't mean that they are anointed to be there. David, listen, was the anointed king. Saul was occupying the position of the king. That's why Saul couldn't deal with Goliath. Let me encourage you today. You are anointed, appointed, and God's power is in you to deal with whatever is standing in front of you right now. Can I get an amen today? Okay, so recognize that right off, that that you are the David for your situation right now. And so let's read this. Let's read this. It says in verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines, talked about the Philistines already, gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Socha, which was, belongs to Judah. And they encamped between Socha and Azekah and Ephes Damon. In other words, this is this region called Shephelah, which was a very important region that's talked about over and over in the battles that the Israelites fought. Verse 2, And Saul, everybody say Saul. That was, that was the Israelites' king. And the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah. Everybody say Elah. This was an important part. We'll talk about more of that in a second. And drew up in battle array against the Philistines. So they were in battle on one side, and the Philistines were on the other side. And it says, the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley in between them, and a champion. Everybody say champion. Come on, say it again. Say champion. Went out from the camp of the Philistines, named, what was his name? Come on, what was his name? Everybody together, what was his name? Goliath. Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Which, in other words, he was nine foot tall. He made Shaq look like a midget. Okay, he was big. Okay, so here's the first, we're going to talk a little bit more about fear. Okay, so here's the first thing you got to understand about fear. Fear will surround a strategically important part of our life. The Philistines and the Israelites were fighting over an extremely strategic part of the nation. The Valley of Elah was fought over many, many times because it was the most fertile valley next to the Mediterranean Sea. This was a valley that produced much a harvest. And the enemy is always going to attack you right before you're about to get your harvest. 
and he's going to try to get you to stand back from that. So he's going to surround the strategic parts of your life. The name Goliath, by the way, means conspicuous. You know exactly what's going on. You see it for what it is, but fear will try to get you to hold back. I believe that many times fear makes us orbit our destiny. We just kind of surround it. We never touch it. We can see it. But we can't get to it because of fear, fear of rejection. I don't know if I really take that step. Am I going to make it? And what happens if I fail? And, and if I fail? So we start rehearsing this thing in our head, rehearsing this thing in our head that ain't never going to happen because you haven't even taken the step yet. And so fear holds you in this pattern. And we're just held in this pattern where we can't move. We can't, we're paralyzed. We can see it, we can taste it, we can almost get, you know, the word champion. It says he was a champion. The, the word champion means man between. And there will always be a man between you and what God has, has for you. And that man happens to be fear most of the time. Wow. Fear will surround your, your strategic, it's strategic. Secondly, fear can look insurmountable. It looks like I'll never get over this. Notice how they describe Goliath. It says he had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. It means he had this, this it, was, it was 125 pounds of, of shielded armor. It says, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. 125 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs and bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600. 15 pounds, and the shield bearer went before him. It, it looks, fear can look insurmountable. It's easily viewed as something that we can never get over. It's a cycle that we feel like we can never break. We can never get out of this. And so fear starts to, to make excuses for us. Well, that's just your personality. Well, that's just my past. Well, that's just where I came from. You don't know about my family. And the reason I can't do this is because of you fill in the blank. That's fear. It's all fear. Well, you know, I don't really want to get in a life group because you know what happened last time I got in a life group and, you know, and, you know, they made, it just didn't work out. And so I don't want to be vulnerable again. Listen, you're going to get hurt in life, period. Welcome to planet earth. You get your feelings hurt. You're going to come to, let me just tell you, this church, you're going to get your feelings hurt. Somebody's going to sit in your seat. Somebody's going to look at you wrong. Somebody's not going to shake your hand. Somebody's not going to smile at you. But this is church. Everybody's supposed to be nice. Can I just tell you right now? The devil comes to church. He comes. Don't point at anybody right now. But don't allow that to be an excuse because that's just fear. That's the spirit of fear. See, I read this recently, that studies show that 40% of the fears that we have are future-related and never happen. 40%, almost half of them, they never happen. 30% are about the past, and guess what? Can't change them. That 70% gets even gooder. 12% of needless, are needless health issues, like things that we start making up. I had a headache yesterday. Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm going to die. <laughs> we, we, that's fear. That's all fear. And you, you may think it, it's a little bit innocent, but the truth of the matter is those things will hold us in orbit of what God has for us because fear is, is protecting what God's best is for you strategically. 10% are not even worth thinking about. 8% are legitimate fears that, guess what, can be dealt with with the right action, which we're going to learn about. We're going to learn from, learn from the, the, the giant slayer, David. I mean, it's 92% of the fears that we deal with are just insignificant. Fear has a voice. Come on, fear has a voice. It'll talk to you. It says in verse 8 of 1 Samuel chapter 17, this champion, this Goliath, he stood and he cried out. He cried out and said, why, why have you come out to line up again? Am I, for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man of yourselves and let him come down to me and let's fight. Who will fight me? Veggie Tales. See, I'm telling you, man, Veggie Tales is awesome. 
You know how important it is to identify the voice of fear in our life? You got to be ready. You got to be, but all of us need to be, have that, that, that sensitivity to recognize what that voice is. Because it will talk to you. It will talk to you. It has a tone, too. Right. That voice always has a tone to it. It always has, has shame and guilt and, and, and intimidation wrapped around it. Always does. I found this story recently in, in Judges chapter 12. Interesting story. Uh, there, there was one of, the, one of the judges, his name was Jephthah. Jephthah was an illegitimate child who was exiled from. He was, he was kicked out of Israel, but eventually Israel realized that the, he was a great warrior. And so they went back to him and said, hey, I need you, you need to help us fight these wars. And so he, he did, and, and he was a, what was called a Gileadite. And, and he would fight for Israel. And one of the fights was, was he defeated this group called the Ephraimites. And it says this, it says in verse 5 of Judges 12, you can look at it later. It says, the Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. And when, when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say to him, are you an Ephraimite? So they're protecting this ford. Jephthah had defeated them. And any of the stragglers would come and say, hey, can I cross? And they would ask him, identify yourself. Are you an Ephraimite? And he would say, no, because he didn't want to get killed. And so the Gileadites were trained to ask him one question. And the question was, they would say to him, then say Shibboleth. And he would say Sibboleth, because he couldn't pronounce the H. And then they'd kill him. <laughs> So they identified who the Ephraimites were by how they talked. And it says, it goes on to say, there fell at that time 42,000 Ephraimites. <laughs> Could you imagine? They're waiting in line, and they're, they're waiting in line like, are you going to get across? I don't know if I'm going to get across. Well, you better learn how to say Shibboleth, Fibboleth, Fibboleth. Man, I don't think I'm going to get it right. You dead, boy. Fear has a voice. Fear has a voice. And every time Goliath would come, he came for 40 days, he would come and he would stand in front of the Israelites and, and, just, and just, just taunt them. Come out and fight me. Come out and fight me. And the Bible says in, in verse 11 and 12, it says, when Saul, the appointed king, not the anointed one, but the positioned one, and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine. They were dismayed. In other words, they were in terror and greatly afraid. But verse 12 says it all. Now, David. David shows up on the scene. David gets there because his dad told him to take some grilled cheese sandwiches to his brother, some bread and some cheese, said, I want you to go feed your brothers. And he shows up. And I want to give you four lessons from a giant killer on how to deal with any fear that you may face in your life. From David, because he defeats Goliath. He shows up on the scene. He's like seeing this guy coming out. He shows up as they were getting ready to go out in the morning to face the Philistines. And he walks with them down to the very front line as the Philistine walks out. And this Philistine jumps out. And David's like, who's this guy right here? The whole army is afraid. The whole army is positioned under the insecurity of Saul. But David shows up. The one who's anointed. The one who's got God on living on the inside of them. The one that says, now hold on a second. Who, who do you think you are holding us back? And so he asks, he goes, so what's going to happen to the guy who whoops that guy's tail? He's giving the Maxwell translation. And, and, and they say, well, you know what's going to happen? He's going he's to get a lot of money. He's going to get Saul's daughter and no taxes. He's like, I'm in. I'm in. But something happens, and this is number one. If you want to learn how to deal with your, the, the, the giant of fear, number one, haters will try and hold you up. Because haters going to hate. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, haters going to hate. Look at your other neighbor. Because, look, look at your other neighbor and say, because, because they're drinking haterade. Drinking haterade. So he shows up. David's on the scene. He's got all the courage and the confidence, and his older brother, Eliab, 
As he's hearing David ask the question, Eliab looks at him in verse 20 and says, his older brother heard what he spoke to them, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? In other words, you're just a little sheepy boy. What do you think you're doing here? Why are you, why are you even here? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Now, why is this important for us to understand that haters will try to hold you up? Because here's the deal. Listen to me. Look at me for a second. Here's the important thing. Whenever you decide to make a change in your life, that change will put pressure on the Eliabs that are in your world. My wife, my wife describes it like this. When you, when you decide to create a new normal, like when you decide to deal with this fear that's held you back for the last 25 years of your life, you create a new normal. You create a new you, and people don't like the new you. They like the old you because the old you helped them feel good about themselves. But the minute you decide to be new you, like you done lost 20 pounds, and somebody say, well, I, I don't like it when you all skinny and stuff. I liked it when you were fat. Because when you were fat, it didn't make them feel insecure. They felt in control. But now you done lost 20 pounds. You're looking all good and like, you know, pretty and everything. Now they, now they got to deal with their fat. Right? They're a liabs. See, see, your new normal will either inspire or intimidate. One of the two. You'll either inspire somebody, because there's people around you, when you create a new normal, they're like, yeah, that means I can do it too. David showed up, and he's like, I'm going to whoop him. And Eliab's like, who are you? Who do you think you are? What are you, what are you talking? He starts backing up, and it's because he was intimidated by the new normal. People are like, I like it when you were fat. I like it when you used to smoke weed with me, and now you're going to church and stuff. I thought we were moving to Colorado, and, and we were going to have a whole life together. <laughs> I liked it when we partied together, and now you're talking about Jesus all the time. New normal. Look at your neighbor. Say, new normal. normal. Come on, say, I'm going up. I'm going up. I'm going up. Haters are going to try to hold you up. They're going to try to hold you back. But I love what David does. In verse 30, he says, then he turned from him towards another. He said, I ain't talking to you no more. I'm not going to deal with you anymore. And he goes and asks somebody else. Goes and asks somebody else. Because haters, they're just going to hate. I mean, they're just going to hate on you. Secondly, secondly, if you want to learn from lessons from a giant slayer, is you got to look at your trophy case. you got to look at your trophy case. Saul finds out that David wants to, wants to fight Goliath. Saul should have been out there fighting Goliath on day one. But he's hiding in his tent. He finds out some 17-year-old kid is there to fight Goliath. He says, come on in. Come on in here, brother. Uh, hey, you going you to take care of Goliath for me? I know you don't look like a warrior, and you look like just, you're just some little kid, but here's what I'll do for you. Here's what I'll do. I'll give you some stuff, and you can fight him. But, but David says right away in verse 34, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it. And, and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine, no problem. You know why? Because David was polishing off his trophies. He was going, let me just tell you what the, the last victory that I had. And that's what we need to do. We need, some of y'all need to polish off some of those old victories that you have because you're, 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 you're cowering under the spirit of fear when you've already won enough victories to handle this anytime. What's your lion? What's your bear? I love, you know, I went to a, a school in Richmond called Hermitage High School, and, and we had a big uh, football stadium because we won a lot of uh, championships in football. So they, they, you know, basically this, this guy who used to play for the San Francisco 49ers came and built us this amazing facility. But when you walked in my school, when you walked in my high school, the first thing, you came through those big doors, the first thing you saw was a big trophy case. 
And there was 1973 championship and 1974 championship. And when we won the track championship and when we won the soccer championship and when we won the wrestling championship and there was a football signed by so-and-so and there were all these trophies. You walked into the gym and there were championship basketball uh, banners all across the stop because every time you walked into school, you felt like a champion because all you saw is the trophies. Today, you know what? You can wake up, dust off your trophy and feel like a champion because no fear can hold you back. Come on, I'm preaching way better than you're saying amen right now. You got to look at your trophy case. Don't let the haters hold you back. And here's the third thing. Only your faith can defeat any fear. Only your faith. My, my faith can defeat any fear. Your faith can help me, inspire me, encourage me, but ultimately it requires my faith. I've got to have the conviction. I like, I like to say it this way. I can't go on a diet for you. I, I can't do it. I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't make the changes for you. You've got to do it, do it for yourself. I, I like to say it this way. Some, my faith will work for you sometimes. Your faith will work for you all the time. And here's the deal. Whatever you face in your world, whatever you face in your life, God has put enough faith in you to handle any situation. Any situation. Any situation, whatever you're, whatever you're bumping up against right now, whatever Goliath is standing in your valley of Ella right now, there's enough in you to take care of him. You, you've got it on the inside of you. When David was in the tent with Saul, Saul said, okay, listen, I'm going to give you my, all my, my stuff. I'm going to give you my sword. I'm going to give you my, my, my coat of mail. I'm going to give you my armor. I'm going to give you my shield. I'm going to give you my helmet. And the Bible says that David, he tried it. He tried to walk it, and he says, I can't use this. I have not tested them. I haven't practiced with this. This isn't me. In other words, I can't live my life with your revelation of God. I can't depend on your prayers. i got to learn how to pray myself. Are you with me? There's a time in your life, listen, young person, there's a time in your life where you got to let go of mama's prayers. And start praying for yourself, believing for yourself, saying for yourself, declaring yourself what God wants to do in your life. Your faith can handle and defeat any fear. Ephesians 6.16, it says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Psalms 56, verse 3, I love this verb. But when I am afraid, I will put my confidence in you, God. Yes, I will trust the promises of God. And since I am trusting in him, what can mere man do to me? I trust the promises of God. I've got a revelation of God. You know, this church is built, was built, started because my wife and I had a trophy. We, we, we developed our faith prior, about six years prior to us, I'm sorry, about four years prior to us planting this church. God spoke to us uh, to plant this church, and there's no way we could have done that if it wasn't for four years earlier when our daughter was going through some major health issues in, my, in, in utero, in my wife's womb. We couldn't touch her. We couldn't hold her. We couldn't lay hands on her. The doctor told us she had tumors all through her brain, and there were two options that they gave us. Two outcomes. Number one was she was going to be a Down syndrome child. Number two, she was going to be an Edwards syndrome child, which means that she would die within the first year. But what they didn't know is that we didn't pick either one of those. We picked number three. Number three option is believe God. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. When the doctor said that to me, something rose up on the inside of me. Something rose up on the end. So when God spoke to us to pick up our family and move to Charlotte, North Carolina, a place we didn't know anybody, we didn't have any money, we didn't have any, any friends here, we didn't know any, we didn't, I mean, it was a brand new place. It was a, a new, new land, no family, no connections. It, I, I, would, I would be lying to say it was easy because it was not easy. But leaning back on that, we had the faith to take the step. <clears throat> And here's the last thing I want to say to you, and then we'll go home, is you got to attack with confidence. you got to attack with confidence. L let, me, let me pose to you in closing that what if David was not the underdog in this situation? What if David, what if Goliath 
was actually the underdog? What if David was the one? I mean, I mean, think about the confidence from the time that he showed up on the scene to the time that he cut Goliath's head off. See, here's, here's some facts, some history about this time. There were, whenever there was a battle, there were three types of warriors that any army had. They had cavalry, which rode horses. They usually went first. They had infantry, which is exactly what Goliath was. They would carry a shield, a sword. Matter of fact, Goliath had a sword, and he had two piercing, a javelin and a spear, and a shield bearer. A shield bearer, somebody that carried a shield, because fear will always try to bring a partner. And so, so here's Goliath. He's an infantry. And then the third group of people were, were called projectile warriors. In David's time, they were called slingers. And so what if, per se, Goliath was the underdog and David was the one who was above him? See, we, we look at this as, you know, David's the young man. He didn't know what he was doing. I don't know if I agree with that. Because if you look at how, how Goliath positioned himself, he positioned himself as an infantryman. And his call to David was, hey, come to me and let's fight close quarters, hand to hand. And let's be honest, if Goliath, nine foot, faced David, probably, let's just say he's 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 David's going to lose every single time. And so David took what he knew. He put on Saul's armor, and it didn't fit him. It didn't work. So the Bible says he took up his staff. He took five smooth stones, put it in his pocket, and he took his slingshot. He didn't have, he didn't have heavy, weighted bronze armor like Goliath did. He wasn't, he wasn't waiting for somebody to attack him. David was agile. He was moving. He was quick. He was running. The Bible actually says that when Goliath called out to him, David started running at Goliath. So much so, Goliath, he couldn't move. He, could, he just had to stand right where he was and wait for Goliath, wait for David to come to him. And Goliath, is, I mean, David's got his slingshot. And as he's moving, I mean, Goliath could probably hardly see him moving around. And then all of a sudden, shoom, a slinger was so good with their slingshot that they could hit within a hair's breadth 200 yards away. They could take a coin and place it as far as they could see it, and they could hit it every single time. They could hit a bird flying through the air. Shoom, they, he was so precise with what he had. See, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You're not facing a giant that's bigger than you. God is way bigger in you than the giant that you may be facing right now. You're not the underdog. You're not coming from behind. You're not, you're not trying, to, trying to make it and survive. God has put in you the power of, of his spirit on the inside of you. You're, you're, you're the David of this generation. You're the David of your job. You're the David of your family. And whatever fear is maybe trying to attach it, whatever spirit of fear is trying to hold you back, just pull out your five smooth stones, get your slingshot, because, and be agile like God's called you to be. Come on, stand on your feet and give the Lord a big clap and a big shout in this place today. Come on, come on, give, give God a shout of praise today. Come on, give him a big shout of praise. Come on, stir that faith up a little bit. Stir that faith up a little bit. Come on, stir that faith up a little bit. Stir it up a little bit. Stir it up a little bit. Stir it up a little bit. Come on, somebody shout, no fear. No fear. No more fear. No more fear in my life. No more fear in my house. No more fear in my family. No more fear in my career. No more fear in my school. No more fear in my marriage. No more fear in my relationships. No more fear in my walk with God. I'm, I'm coming out strong today, God. I'm taking down Goliath in my world today. Come on, everybody, just lift your hands to heaven. Just thank him right now. Father, thank you. No more fear. No more fear in my life. No more fear in my life right now. In Jesus' name, we believe it. We declare. Come on, take 20 seconds, and you begin to speak with your faith over that spirit of fear. Come on, take 20 seconds as we sing. Take 20 seconds and begin to speak to that fear right now.
the spirit, fear is removed. And running, defeated. No more fear. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we declare right now, in Jesus' name, we break the spirit of fear over our lives right now. No more anxiousness. No more anxiety. We break its power now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, sing it. I will live and not die. Come on, sing that part. I will live. I will live. I will not die. I will live.